Hello, I'm a local archaeologist and my name is Pamela and I started digging when I was 15 when I joined Wandsworth Historical Society. Uh, much later, I studied European prehistory at University College and then got a job working in the gravel pits of East London on uh, Roman in the quarries on Roman and prehistoric sites a far cry from what I had been studying, but much fun, and I worked in a museum for 20 years. When I was 16, once with Historical Society, we're digging in Putney, and I was there, and while I was trialling away quietly, I came across a circle in the ground, and it turned out to be this pot, and this is the first complete pot that I ever dug up in my digging career. And so it has a special place in my heart. It contained the burnt bones of somebody. It's a Roman, early Roman cremation burial. You feel, well, I do anyway, um, a kind of odd feeling when you dig up a person. And there was somebody in this pot and they were buried like this. Now, if you look at the pot carefully, it's not the finest pot that was ever made. It's full of mistakes. And you can see the potter putting on the white slip um, managed to let it dribble. The, later on, we found other pots in the group and they had holes in them and all sorts of things. These are not good for cooking, which is what this is, or for holding anything. And you often find this in burials where people are buried with defective objects, especially pots or ones that have been deliberately damaged. It may be that defective pots were seconds and cheaper, or you make it, you're make burying somebody with somebody that nobody else will want, and the person buried can keep their objects. So this is a fine example of a not very well made early Roman pot. I'm now going to move on to some other objects from different places and of different ages. And the first one I want to show you is somewhere between 10,000 and 6,000 years old. It's a flint ax. It was found in the river, which is why it's stained brown, and it's from Battersea. And these were made by the people, the Stone Age people, uh, after the Ice Age and before they were farmers, they were hunting and fishing and collecting wild food. And these axes come in different sizes and would have been used for chopping down trees, carpentry and other things. And they're all characteristic by this particular flake here, which is called a tranche flake. So they're known as tranche axes or tranche adzes. And also their common name is a Thames pick because so many have been found in the Thames. And this is one of the oldest objects in the Wandsworth Historical Society collections. And next is much later, it's about 2,800 years old. That's 28 centuries ago. And it is dated to the early Iron Age, the very earliest part when decorating pots was the fashion. It's handmade and if you look very carefully, you'll see lumps in it, whitish lumps. These are pieces of burnt flint that are added to the clay to make the pot stronger when it was fired, rather like putting stones in cement to make concrete. The interesting thing is, it's the decoration. It's done with the fingernail, and especially here. And these marks are about the size of my fingers, but some pots have much smaller ones. And we think that perhaps children were being used to decorate pots. Probably fun help, helping the family. You also get scored lines and other things, but the fingernails and the finger impressions are the most common. And it's a large jar perhaps about the size. And it came, it came from Putney. 
This is also from Putney. And I need to put gloves, put my gloves on properly. It's also Iron Age and something quite rare and quite nice to have found such a good one. And I found that myself. Um, it's a it's a bone point of some kind. It's made from a sheep or goat leg bone and it's been polished and then it has a scoop like end. We don't know what they were for. Some people think they were for scooping out something when eating, um, such as bone marrow out of a bone, or some have suggested that some of them are used as substitute spears for when they made offerings in rivers and lakes. But this is an extremely nice one, and it has a lovely hole for putting a cord on it. So maybe somebody you know, is a tool for making something or eating, and you could hang it around your neck. Try and show it a bit more closely. It is really, really lovely and lovely to handle. So we don't have a precise date for it, but it'd be well over 2,000 years old. I'm going to move to the Roman period. And this is what we call colloquially Samian pottery. It is red glossy pottery. And its technical name is terra sigillata because it's often got stamps on it, either the potter's name or decoration. Its glossy surface is not a slip. It's not quite showing so well here, but it's shiny and smooth and some are really, really shiny. This particular piece um, was made in the south of France, but it was also made in the area that's between France and Germany. And in the Roman period, that was called Gaul. It's not a glaze, it's, it, you need special, you need very special um, clay with minerals in it that produces this shine. And when you have a decorated one like this, which has got a running, a hunting scene with a dog chasing a deer, and you can just about see the deer's antlers and the head and of the deer, of the dog chasing it. You would get some stamps. Maybe there were special people who, who designed the stamps and you could make up patterns of all kinds. This has got an egg and dart decoration at the top. It's got sort of cord-like decoration. There might be leaves or another scene on an, another part of it. And then you, you stamp the decoration into a mold and put the soft clay in the mold, press it in, add a base, because this is a bowl and would need a base, and um, coat it with the special slip. And when it's fired in a kiln, it comes out shiny like magic. And people have been trying for years to copy this method. And there's a farmer in, in East Anglia who's nearly made it. But it, the, the magic of it hasn't be, has escaped everybody. But he's getting there. And this is um, a piece from Putney. Um, Putney to Wandsworth from along the Thames and where we found quite a lot of decorated pieces in the past, but not anymore. Now I'm going to move on to something much more recent. That piece of pot dates to perhaps 1800 years ago, the early Roman period, first to second century. This belongs to the end of the 17th and 18th centuries in Britain. And it's called Staffordshire Combware. Um, it's sometimes called by archaeologists as a nickname, Bakewell Tartware because of the decoration. And would have been Highly elegant, you get beautiful bowls, cups, uh, plates, in a, sort of serving plates for dinner, um, made in Staffordshire where some of the nicest ones are, but also elsewhere. And it has a deceiving decoration. This one 
when you look at it, you think you might they might have put the brown stripes onto yellow, but no, it's actually the other way around. First, the the um, clay is covered, the dried clay is covered with um, a brown slip. Then somebody carefully pipes the white stripes, and then it's covered with the yellow glaze. In this case, they had also used a comb for making a feather-like pattern. They also turn up often in the 17th century or a little bit earlier with as, as wedding plates, special anniversary plates, and you might get the names and the date written on them. So sort of souvenir, commemorative things. But this is the ordinary, ordinary little dish for the table. And a little bit earlier, we have this collection of objects from Battersea, from a house that was excavated in Battersea. We didn't get the whole pot because it was a building site, but it had obviously broken up in the same place. It's conveniently dated with a, a little date stamp on here. Um, and I'll try and show it to you. This is cool. This is a stoneware bottle, so it's fired very hard and the pieces can be quite sharp. And then you put, during firing, they'd shovel salt onto it. And if you find a piece, the surface is, is pimply, a bit like coarse orange peel. You can see where it hasn't completely fused. So that's a very easy way of identifying stoneware because however hard they, of this type, however hard they tried, they could never make it quite smooth. So if you jiggle it up and down in the light, you will see the bumps. Now, this is um, a particularly weird thing. It's called, it's part of what is called a witch bottle. And with this one, we also had the poor cat who survives as a skull. And they were all found together. Now, this one is, is we know the date because it has 1669 actually written on it. It was very popular to do this in the 16th and 17th centuries. People are still making them now, but they use plastic bottles. You, in the old days, you would find them by chimney places, doorways, fireplaces, that sort of thing. And the idea was to drive, it was magic to drive off evil, evil spirits, witches, and that sort of thing. And recently, more work has been done to analyze the contents of these bottles. And they would contain things like hair, fingernails, fingernail, um, urine, and something sharp like pins. And one of the thoughts, one of the things to do was to put all this in the bottle, put it by the fireplace, and while it gently warmed, it would harm the witch that was trying to get you. And by warming it slowly, you increase, you kept the pain going for the poor old witch. And then when it exploded, it killed the witch. There are variations on this theme, but that is basically the idea is to protect you from being harmed by some evil person a witch. So they do turn up quite often. Several hundred have been found. They're found in America, Canada as well, and it's 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 the fashion of the time. But the last one was found in 1998 on the foreshore in a, a plastic bottle. Now I'm going to produce something that you can do. You might find that pottery in the park 
in your garden, somewhere like that, is another thing that you find quite commonly in open spaces is this piece of rubbish from the past, which is a clay pipe for smoking tobacco. And you find those everywhere because they're the cigarette ends, the sweet wrappers of the past. And because they change shape over time, starting small, because tobacco, when it first came in the 1680s, was very expensive. They're very good for archaeologists. Fashions change. Some of them have names. Some of them even have the initials of the people who made them. So they're extremely useful for, for dating. And you, sometimes they can give you a date within 20 years. And because they break and because people had a, a smoke and then threw them away, you, they don't, they, they're very tight for dating. They're not something like a coin that people might keep for tens of years, even longer. And if you do find one and do wash it, please don't put it in your mouth. Because this clay, until it's been tempered with things like milk or whatever they did in the past, actually sticks to your skin. It sucks the moisture out of your skin, rather like if you put your and in a freezer, and it's not really nice. So avoid that, and it might be dirty anyway. But if you find one, you can download from the Society of Clay Pipe Research one of these charts. And all you have to do, it prints out at the same size as the pipe, is match yours as near as possible to one of the ones on this chart and then you get the date. It won't be exact because they're handmade, but as close as possible, and you'll get a date range for your pipe. And this one, just going to do it, very neatly fits 1700 to 1770. And if it's got the maker's initials on it, they, they had licenses if they were honest, and you can get the dates that they were making the pipes. It's an easy thing to do. And if you have one of these charts, it's just what any archaeologist would do. We don't use anything more special. And the last thing I'm going to produce is something I'm working on at the moment. Just to remind you that it's not always the attractive looking things that can have a fantastic story. This is a piece of a hand millstone called a quern. And otherwise it just looks like a boring piece of stone. But there are lots of things that are wrong with it. It's not its original color because it's been burnt. Um, from the other pieces that I have, I can see that it's been broken up somebody has sliced part of it off and one of the others found with it has been cut very carefully and very precisely in half and all the other two that we managed to rescue from this trench were also burnt. I managed to identify the rock from one of them and then got stuck on the other two. And at the time, my son was studying geology at the University of Leicester. And I gave it to him and said, you know, can any of your mates work out what this is? And the answer came back, the whole flat didn't know what it was. So they took it to a lecturer. And she had a thin slice cut from one of the pieces to make something like a microscope slide which is this, I'll try and get it the right way up. I'm upside down. And that's what it looks like when the, the photograph of the image on the slide, and it shows all the different minerals inside this, and they're very characteristic. The green ones are glauconite, for example. And the other one, which was burnt to a dark brown color, 
also gave an analysis that was allowed it to be identified. This one was a puzzle for a while and then they checked the university collections and found a piece of rock that was almost identical. So we know that this quiet piece of stone, which would have been a very heavy object about this size originally in two pieces, two circles, to make a, a quern to grind flour or metal ore or anything else you needed to grind. This was originally quarried in Lincolnshire and it's come all the way to London, probably by sea and river because these are very heavy, more than 2,000 years ago. And if you think about it, if something's traveled that far and these are quite rare, and this is a long way for one of these to have come. They're generally not found in this area. They're more of a Midlands find. They must have cost a lot of money, effectively, at that time, and been very precious. But it ends up being chopped up and thrown away. And this is what I'm working on at the moment, so I haven't come to the end of the story. Now... If you would are interested in doing anything like archaeology, there are things that you can do, um, and there are things on the summer that you might like to take part in. If you go go to the Fulham Palace website, you will see some local things for families and people of all ages. They've got a, a an event coming up in June that you can go along and 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 do some handing of objects and things, I suspect, uh, but it will be about flint implements, I think. But other things happen all the time there. You just need to go to the website and see what's on next. There is a young archaeologist club based there, but it's booked up for this term. So if you that, if you want to join in on that, you need to keep you posted on looking for when the next year's bookings come up. In the summer, between the 17th of July and the 1st of August, there is the Festival of British Archaeology, which you can also search, and we'll add the contact details um, to this. And there are events of all kinds, from talks, open days, practical archaeology, everything held all over the country. So all you have to do is search on the festival um, website, put in the area where you are, and it will tell you where the nearest things you can do are happening. And that happens every year for the last week of term normally and the first week of the school holidays. So there you can join in and go and see things and perhaps get hooked like me. <laughs> <laughs>